This video was brought to you by Indently.io, learning Python made simple. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you five uncommon Python tricks slash features that I really love to use in Python. Starting with trick number one. And for this example, I'm going to have two iterables, one which is going to be some numbers of type list of integer, and the other one which is just going to be a string containing hello world. Now, usually if you want to slice an iterable, you would pass in that iterable and you would also use the slice notation, such as colon colon minus one to reverse that iterable. And that will also work for the text. And right now, if we were to run this, it would work perfectly fine. It would reverse those iterables. But now imagine you want to use this in many other places. As programmers, we don't really want to copy and paste that everywhere because maybe we will want to change this implementation later. And of course, changing it in each place is a bad idea. So my first trick slash tip is to create a slice object. And you can do that by using the built-in slice and passing in that same notation. So right now we have nothing, nothing minus one, which means from nothing to nothing, give it a minus one step. And that will give it this syntax. And then we can pass in rev and rev here and it will give us the exact same result, except this time we can actually change the implementation in one place. So we can also say minus two, if that's what we want. And this time it's going to reverse it with a step of two. Otherwise we can create another example, which is the first five, and I'm going to call that F5, and that will be of type slice. And we will create this slice here that grabs everything from the beginning to the index of five. And now if we were to replace this with F5, and this one below with F5, you'll notice that we will only get the first five elements back. So slice objects can actually be very useful. Moving on to trick number two. Suppose you have two sets and that you want to perform some basic operations on these sets. Well, Python gives us the chance to actually use a lot of the built-in operators to perform the same operations that we can get with dot notation, such as difference and intersection. But the first thing I want to show you is how you can combine two sets. And to do so, all you need to do is type in your first set and then use a pipeline with the second set. And this will combine these two sets. So if we were to run this, we would get a set that combined these elements. And of course, since it can't contain duplicates, four and five will not be repeated. Otherwise, we can also subtract elements by using the minus. Now, if we were to subtract set B from set A, you'll see that we will only get one, two, and three back because here we had four and five in set B, which means it took away four and five from set A. And keep in mind that order here does matter. So if we put set B minus set A, we'll get eight, six, and seven back because four and five were the only elements found in set B that were present in set A. So those were the only ones it could subtract. Now, moving on to something more niche, if you use the ampersand, this operation is going to give us back all the elements that are shared. In other words, the intersection of these two sets. So if we were to run this, you'll see that four and five are present in both of these sets. Otherwise, we can also get the unique elements from both of these sets by using an up arrow. So now if we run this, you'll see that we will get only the unique elements. And this is also known as the symmetric difference. Trick number three, suppose you have some sort of class such as a book that contains a title of type string and the amount of pages it has of type integer. Now, what I'm going to show you how to do is how to make this class compatible with F strings. And to be more specific, I'm going to show you how you can specify your very own F string specifiers. And to do this, we need to use a Dunder method called format. And it takes a format specifier of type any. And what it returns to us is a string. And I personally love to annotate this stuff because it gives me a clear picture of what this actually does. Without these annotations, I personally get really confused. So you're not required to add these, but I highly encourage you do. Anyway, what we're going to do inside here is use match and provide the format specifier. So depending on what the user inserts as a format specifier, we're going to return a string based on what they have provided. So here we can say case for time. And what we're going to return here is the self.pages. 
and I actually want to return an f string, so f with the self.pages divided by 60, and that will be formatted to dot 2f, which will round it to a float with only two decimals. And out of that, I'm going to add an h. So this will be the total time it takes to read the book. And I'm just going to pretend that 60 pages per hour is a decent time. But another case we're going to provide is a case for caps. And all we will return here is self.title.upper. And these are just some examples. You can return whatever kind of string you want. Don't take this literally. There might not really be an advantage for returning self.title here. It's just an example. Otherwise, for every other scenario, I'm going to raise a value error that we provided an unknown specifier. Unknown specifier for book. But with that being done, we can now use this comfortably in F strings. And to demonstrate it, I'm going to create my if name is equal to main check, which creates both a main entry point and inserts the if name is equal to main check for me. Then with that, I can create two books. One is going to be Harry Potter of type book, and the book is going to equal very Harry Potter of 300 pages. Then the second book will be Python Daily of type book, which will equal a book with the title of Python Daily, and this will be 20 pages. And the first book I'm going to print to the console will be Harry Potter. So format, Harry Potter, and here we can provide one of our specifiers, such as caps. Then I'm going to duplicate this and call the second one read time, or give it the text of read time, because here we're going to insert time. Now, the next time we run this, you'll see that providing those format specifiers, we can get our object formatted in a special way directly in our F string. And again, this was just for demonstration purposes, because obviously you can easily just type in upper in, or actually, no, you can't, Never mind, Because what I meant to type is harrypotter.title.upper. And that might just be more readable to begin with. But what's nice about this is we can actually insert any book object, such as Python daily, and it will work exactly the same way. The downside to this approach is that who in the world is ever going to understand which format specifiers work with your F strings without reading some extensive documentation. So I'd love to hear if any of you actually use this in Python. I personally love playing around with this in personal projects, but if anyone else had to actually use my project, I think this would be incredibly unintuitive. Up next, we have the walrus operator, and I personally love using it. I know a lot of people say it's quite confusing, but I hope these examples will help you understand it better so it doesn't appear so confusing anymore. And the very first thing I'm going to do is create a dictionary of users. And for the key, I'm using an integer and as the value, just the string of the name of the user. Now imagine you want to create some functionality based on whether a user exists or not. One approach you can take is creating a new variable called user of type string or none and typing in users.get and passing in the key of the user that you want to get. So with that, we can easily check if user print user exists, else print no user or boy, whatever, no user found. And this works quite fine. I mean, it does exactly what we want it to. It checks if a user exists or not. And if it exists, it's going to say that the user exists. Otherwise, it will say that no user was found. And we can verify that by putting an ID that exists, and you'll see that Mario exists. But now let's save one line of code by using the walrus operator. So here we can type in if user walrus operator is equal to users.get with the value of three, then we're going to perform the same operation. So just like that, we can completely remove that line of code and perform the exact same operation. And the way the walrus operator works is that it first evaluates the expression and then assigns it to the value before performing the check. So if this returns none, user will have the value of none. If this returns a value, user will have that value. So now if we run this, we're going to find out that there was still no user found with the key of three. But if we insert zero, it's going to say that Bob exists. 
So not only is it going to get that value, it's also going to assign it to user directly in the if statement. And that was one simple example of where it can be useful. But another example is in functions and classes. For example, here we can have a function called get info, and that will take some text of type string and will return to us a dictionary. Then right below, what we're going to return is this dictionary, starting with the words, because what we want to do is get the info regarding the text that we insert. So first, I just want to split the words. And inside here, I'm going to create some parentheses, because if you want to use the walrus operator inside a dictionary, for example, you're going to have to use parentheses to not confuse Python. So here we can type in words, walrus operator, and then text.split. So we're creating this variable within the dictionary, which means we can also use it on a different line. For example, if we want to create word count, we can do that. And then we can say that the word count is the length of the words. So now we're using that variable directly under rather than calling text.split twice. And finally, we can use it one more time below by saying character count. And that will be the length of an empty string dot join, and we will join those words because I don't want to count the empty spaces. So it was quite neat that we could just create the variable within, but now we can print get info with the text of Bob. And if we were to run this, we'd find out that there's only one word, which is Bob, and the word count is one with a character count of three. We can also add different sentences such as hello, Bob, and my name is Bob. And with that being done, we will get all of this information back quite easily. And as for the final trick that I want to show you in this video, what we're going to be jumping into is a concept called currying. And if you're a professional Python developer, you're probably going to bring up partials, but I'm not going to be covering partials in this lesson. I'm going to show you something that you can do quite easily, which we call currying. And to demonstrate how this works, we're going to create a function called multiply setup. And that's going to take one argument or one parameter. And what this will return to us is a callable. And you'll see in just a moment why we're returning a callable. But within it, we're going to create a function called multiply. So a nested function that takes another float, which we will name B and returns to us a float because what we want to do here is multiply two numbers. But inside the inner function, we're going to return the actual operation, which is A times B. While outside of it, we're going to return the multiply function. So why did I do this? Why did I set up a circus in Python? Well, while it might look like a joke, this can actually be seen as an ideal approach for functions that you need to call with the same setup over and over. For example, let's create a function called double, which is going to be of type callable. And here we're going to provide the multiply setup. And since all we want this function to do is double numbers, we're going to insert two. Then we will duplicate this and create one that triples numbers. And that will take the setup of three. So what we did on both of these lines is create two callables using our custom setup. This just means that we can now refer to the variable name of double as a function. And all we need to do is insert only one number instead of two. So here we can type in five, we can type in three, and we can type in even 100. And each time we call this function, it's going to double the number because we already provided that setup. And essentially all this is saving us is the trouble from typing in two over and over again on the first line. And once again, you can also do this with partials. If your functions get really complicated, I recommend you look into partials. But if you have some very simple setup, such as the one I showed you, currying your function might just make much more sense. And this also works with triple. So we can just replace all of these and we will be able to run all of those without having to provide the value of three each time. So this is just something else I learned incredibly late when I was learning Python, but I think it's a really cool concept that you guys might use in the future. Maybe you'll never use it, but it's definitely something to keep in mind, or at least the theory of how it works. If you really want to create some disgusting code, you can even experiment this approach using lambdas. 
But otherwise, that's actually all I wanted to cover in today's video. Do let me know in the comment section down below if you learned something new or if you have something you want to add regarding this video. But otherwise, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.